these people have been have watched their parents, especially the millennials. Let's take that as a good example. Um, they've watched their parents get treatments and you know Botox, and they've heard more and more about uh, aesthetics and the value of, of looking good, and they've integrated that into a lifestyle um, uh, attitude that aesthetics would go along with working out and being healthy and eating the right things and et cetera. And they're interested in um, doing some preventive work, but they're also interested in be, and accepting uh, that aesthetics is part of a regimen or a lifestyle choice. And that's a new phenomenon. Hello, everybody. And welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where we interview the movers and the shakers of the aesthetics business. Today, we are so fortunate to have Jeff Franson as our guest. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Glad to be here. Yes, it's wonderful to have you. Um, a number of our guests, or a number of our listeners have heard you and they've read certainly read things that you've written but they don't really know who you are who is jeff frenson well um, presently i work in as a journalist mostly also a uh, uh, a publisher and video producer for the aesthetic industry i've been in the aesthetic industry as a journalist since 2007 when i was hired to uh, be the uh, editor-in-chief of plastic surgery practice, formerly Plastic Surgery Products magazine. And um, that was a, uh, I'd say a three or four year stint. And then I joined um, <clears throat> Medical Insight as a, uh, as a reporter and an editor. And I've kind of stayed in that spot. I've interviewed uh, literally probably a hundred, more than a hundred uh, practitioners, um, executives, and analysts in the uh, aesthetic industry. And I know an awful lot of physicians and I've uh, been able to make friends with many people in the industry. And uh, I report on all aspects of the industry from uh, the uh, business side to the technical, the clinical, and uh, mostly in terms of news and new products. That seems to be my particular specialty. But uh, I, I didn't start in, um, the medical field at all. I was hired for uh, to edit <clears throat> plastic surgery practice specifically because I didn't have a medical background. The publisher was looking for someone who had editorial strengths, the ability to put a magazine together. And I had been in the magazine business for many, many years and um, actually came out of a 10 year stint in the movie business to join plastic surgery practice. And, um, so I've, uh, I've been around the block a few times. Um, I'm originally from California, Northern California, but now I live in the Los Angeles area. And I lived in New England for 23 years working in high-tech uh, computer press, um, Ziff Davis and CNET and a few others, and I rose, raised a family back there. But I got the calling to return to California in 2005 and six to work in the movie business. and. Um, actually began in 1997. So it was really, um, I go between publishing and movies <laughs> all, all my life. Well, you're certainly well recognized at all the aesthetics meetings across the core specialties. I, I've seen you at s numerous meetings and I know I've had the good fortune of being interviewed by you many mm -hmm. times and reading your publications. And, and you certainly are right there in the cutting edge of aesthetics. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit more about this movie business. I had no idea you were in the movie business. Are you an actor? Are you a writer, a producer, a director? Uh, what, what do you mean the movie business? I, I'm all of the above. Uh, the, uh, at one point I was doing a lot of um, magazine, selling magazine articles. They were interviews with uh, little known movie directors and one of them, uh, he and I became friends and he, and he was active in Hollywood. And uh, he invited me to move out from New England to uh, join him and produce movies. And we produced 15 movies for Lionsgate Entertainment. Um, and uh, they were all released and a few of them were quite successful. And I, um, I acted as a producer, writer, um, actor, um, uh, director. I've directed one movie and uh, direct co-directed a couple 
And uh, I currently I've been right, directing mu music videos for some um, musician folks that I know. But these movies came out in 2005 through 2008. And um, there was 15 movies in three years and heavy burnout on that. I burned out on that and then went back into the publishing business. But uh, I've stayed in the movie business all through this time, although my bread and butter is working uh, with uh, Mike Moretti and his team uh, at Medical Insight for doing all kinds of news reporting, market research, market reports, et cetera. But I have, uh, once you get in the movie business, being a director, producer, writer, actor, musician, editor, et cetera, it's like a virus that never leaves you. It's a bug. <laughs> Speaking people of viruses. Catch, people catch it and they never can get rid of it. Interesting. <laughs> I'm sure that's carried over into your aesthetics uh, uh, world and so forth. And you've been with us, you said, for 13 years in aesthetics, correct? Right, exactly. And so I've got You've seen an awful lot. You, yes. uh, and why don't you compare and contrast 13 years ago with the present? Give us a little insight. What have you seen over the last 13 years? You said you started, we had no medical experience. And right. there you are immersed in aesthetics, which would be plastics and derm and, and all the other core specialties in the aesthetics business and probably non-core. Um, yeah. Give us a feel for what, what you've seen over the last 13 years. Um, the, the, the two things that really stand out for me is the, the is the, uh, incredible invest and in advancements that have been made in just the, in the technologies and moving from not moving from, but incorporating uh, non-surgical and surgical together in all these practices. It's really um, expanded the world of aesthetics, I think. And the technologies that have been developed uh, are kind of mind boggling at times. Um, you know, I, I don't want to name any products or technologies in particular, but there's been a range of them that have been developed and it really has brought uh, consumers closer in and willing, you know, to be, uh, to be worked on. And then also uh, another connected to that is the, um, the efforts of the industry to uh, attract people and may also make them make a plastic surgery and aesthetic medicine less stigmatized as it was sort of stigmatized you know, pre previous to the millennium and even maybe part, maybe still is a little bit, but not nearly as much. And the other, the second part of it is really the, um, the amazing influx of, since I've been involved in this industry, the amazing influx of non-core doctors uh, trying to get in on the cash pay business of uh, mostly non-surgical, non-invasive type treatments and injectables. I know that the major injectable companies have really gone after that group and so have other manufacturers, but it's been kind of an amazing thing to watch and also a little bit scary at times because um, it's so people who are not in, you know, trained specifically for plastic surgery or dermatology or cosmetic dermatology, they, if they're not trained for that initially and go through that, all those steps, you know, we had the phenomenon for, and still do, I imagine, of the of the weekend wonders. You know, the non-core doctors that would come in, the dentists and the et cetera, you know, foot doctors and family doctors that would come in and just get a weekend course on how to do a laser, and then they were kind of dangerous without all the training. And so, there's been a lot of pressure to get kind of the groups uh, in line. And I think just lately, in the last few years, the the, the societies in our industry have realized that they need to, you know, take, kind of take control of this, this, this uh, phenomenon and have gone out and actually done a lot of training. And there's some training organizations that have popped up over the last 10 years that have been like, the, I guess, uh, the one that, uh, that, uh, that's run out of Ohio, uh, et cetera. And, you know, it's just been a more of an acceptance uh, of all the different people because the, the fact of the matter is that this industry has around nine or 10 if we're going to be optimistic, 10% market penetration overall. So there's all that business that needs to be had and it can, everyone can take advantage of that. And there's enough business to go around. And so the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the medical side of it, the, the medical societies in particular have become more liberal and willing to um, <laughs> save a few patients and make sure that all of these doctors maybe get some training that's valuable 
Those are the two major themes that I've seen running through the industry. I think there are probably some, a lot of sub themes that, you know, branch off of that. And, um, and also with the, the, the pandemic, that's also created a, a sea change in some respects to the whole industry. But uh, it's an amazing place to be. I'm, I'm very grateful to be in an industry that is just so positive and just, you know, constantly growing. Even in a pandemic, it's growing. It's it just, a, it, I have to stop and pinch myself sometimes and say, wow. <laughs> so speaking of the pandemic, how has the pandemic affected you? And how has it affected this business, the, the aesthetic business, in your opinion? Well, um, the aesthetic business, uh, I think it, uh, it, it, it suffered for a few months there. Uh, in the early part of, you know, the, we had a first quarter that was going to take off, you know, even over 2019 um, profit levels and revenue levels. It was just poised. And like a lot of uh, industries in, uh, worldwide, uh, in America, in the United States in particular, there was a gro growth pattern happening. And uh, that kind of slam got slammed, especially uh, among the, uh, the the box manufacturers. They really have hurt, been hurting. Actually, there's two different two different scenarios for the for the um, energy based uh, device manufacturers. The companies that were well funded and well set up and financially well off have been doing pretty well globally. And then you have the other companies, the smaller companies that maybe were you know, having some financial difficulties, they got slammed. But even they are starting to come back because uh, the people involved um, really have been creative about finding ways to overcome the, the business uh, devastation of the, of the spring and portions of the summer. And then as soon as the, the in the United States, and I think globally too, as soon as uh, aesthetic uh, practices and clinics were able to open a, again with again the industry and the and the physicians working with the government to make sure that safety protocols were in place and made sense it's it's gone it's it's starting to come back and uh, it's a little bit slow for some sectors of the of the market but in general it's coming back um, some sectors like the skincare and injectables uh, side and never they didn't suffer as badly as some of the other segments of the market but Again, there's something about this industry that just people want to look good and they want to look good with the kind of technologies and approaches that are now in, in place in this industry. And it's attracted you know, many more people, I think, into the, into the marketplace. It still has a low penetration rate too, which means that this industry has a long way to go uh, to be you know, really, um, <laughs> really take off. And for me personally, it actually, the pandemic has been good for me because um, it actually created more business uh, for me uh, working uh, alongside Medical Insight. We, we created the Aesthetic Industry Association to kind of bring together the top people in the industry to discuss the solutions to some of these problems created by the pandemic. And it's been remarkably successful. And so, and I've had other uh, opportunities at the same time during the pandemic and uh, also kept my finger in uh, the, the developing some uh, video and mu music projects. And, we, and I, I help publish a, a bi-monthly newsletter. It's an industry newsletter. It's really the first industry newsletter of its kind in, this, in the aesthetic field. A lot of the publications in the aesthetic field are um, product related publications that are not really serious business publications. And, they're journalistic, but they're trade magazines and trade publications, which tend to be, and I know coming from plastic surgery practice magazine, we, we tended to be cheerleaders for the industry, mm -hmm. but the Aesthetic Insights newsletter, uh, which uh, I, I work with uh, Mike Moretti on every, every week, um, really talks about issues and you know, things that are going on that are of import and um, talk about the people involved and you know, some of the trends that uh, the other publications just don't get into. Uh, there are some industry newsletters out there. Like I say, they're more trade oriented. And what we publish is amazing. Uh, we've had, we have about 30,000 people on our mailing list and it's all across the industry and even into Wall Street and other places like that. So there was a real need for this. And this was all developed during the uh, pandemic. 
and also I've been doing some video production news reports that go along with that newsletter. And it's just been an exciting time. I'm very grateful to be so busy at a time when many people don't have that opportunity or they had the opportunity taken away. Well, congratulations. That's wonderful. So tell us a little bit more about the Aesthetic Industry Association. You mentioned it a couple of times. I see it there in your uh, background, uh, yes. along with the beautiful woman there to your left, over your left shoulder. What exactly <laughs> is the Aesthetic Industry Association? The Aesthetic Industry Association is really uh, something that was um, uh, developed by myself and uh, Michael Moretti uh, to be an actual industry association. I mean, there are some, a few medical societies that have their arms into uh, the FDA and they work as a kind of um, uh, industry cheerleader for their, for their group, for their, like the ASPS has something like that, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. And there are a few others, but we're very independent. And the idea of the Aesthetic Industry Association is to really bring together some people who um, normally would be in tight competition with each other, but they are willing to sit down and put their swords down and get together and talk about solutions to existing problems, the big problems that affect the industry, such as the market penetration problem, which will eventually get resolved. Also, uh, we are starting up some working groups that address particular sore areas in the uh, medical aesthetics field. And I would include with that, uh, the FDA uh, interface with the industry. Um, I've uh, been uh, successful in, uh, uh, in bringing uh, Peter Marks of the FDA into our universe. And he's been willing to talk to uh, the Aesthetic Industry Association and be interviewed and, and um, along with the uh, CEOs and executives that represent the different uh, segments in this market. So that's one working group idea. And then also uh, we want to approach the regenerative medicine side, which is a little bit of a, um, I mean, it has so much potential in the aesthetics field, but it's not really totally coordinated very well. And there's a, as, as so typical in the aesthetics industry, um, that particular sector is populated with a lot of little small companies that are trying to get in. And then you have a few movers and shakers that are really making an effort to get in and do something important. And that connects up with the FDA as well. Um, the pandemic uh, issue is, is, a, is a working group as well. I mean, we have monthly uh, meetings, board meetings of the Aesthetic Industry Association in which all, all, of, those, all of the issues surrounding the pandemic are addressed and uh, there's some market research that is uh, given out at that time and uh, we've been tracking it month to month and uh, I can tell you that it's looking better every month as far as the recovery curve goes. So those are, those are a couple of areas of, of uh, expertise that we're developing and we're gonna think of some more. Uh, several of the people, uh, board members on the um, Aesthetic Industry Association are are willing to work with us or combine their, their energies and efforts with other people that they're normally competitive with to address some of these general issues that are affecting our industry. And I don't believe that there's any other group or association out there that is like this for medical aesthetics. Um, many industries have uh, industry associations that uh, interface with Washington and state governments and uh, medical boards and whoever else is, you know, regulatory uh, uh, organs and not in the aesthetics field. Like I say, there's some societies that do some work in that area, but nothing that is, is broad based is what we're doing. So I, I'm going to stop talking about it right now. Hopefully that is well, something. I applaud your efforts. And uh, <laughs> did you say that started after COVID? It's, it, it, well, the, the idea had been percolating and we've been figuring out what, how to make it work since about December or maybe a little before that of 2019. But then when COVID happened, it gave us a, it gave us a reason for being. And um, Absolutely. we started to put together what we call crisis calls with these executives. And that whole format has morphed into more uh, generalized board meetings. Although uh, the upcoming, uh, for example, the upcoming meet, uh, call we're doing at the end of October 
is all about branded chains in the in the med, in the medical aesthetic space. That's you know a, that's an a interesting handful, topic and one I know a little bit about. Right, that uh, you're associated with one of those. Yes, and it's uh, we're going to try to bring in more people that can talk about that on a regular basis. So this has a likelihood of expanding. Have you been in touch with uh, the people at the Aesthetic Society, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery? I know you mentioned that other lesser society a moment ago. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I've I've talked with uh, the fellow that is my interface there is a guy named Robert Singer. Yes, yeah, Dr. Robert Singer, one of my mentors. Well, fantastic. Let me know if I can help you in any way. Because I, I used to be in charge of industry relations. And as you know, as a past president and uh, chairman of the board of trustees, I, I'm very, very interested in our relationships with industry. And I'd, mm-hmm. I'd love to talk to you more about the Aesthetic Industry Association and how we might work together uh, as a society. I'm all for it. Uh, all for it. Great. I, I think bringing the societies in is going to be a next logical step. And just having that touch point and uh, to let them know that we're not a we're not a threat that we want to work with them, I think it's going to be a, a I think it's going to be a marvelous addition to the industry. Well, and I have always felt that the aesthetics industry, that is to say, the providers of goods and services, uh, are it's it is critical to our growth and development as practitioners, as physicians. Without industry, we don't have. Uh, new products, new goods, new services, and so forth. So it's a natural symbiotic relationship between the physicians and uh, industry, in my opinion. So speaking of that, I would like to know your opinion since you've been around watching. And when you first got involved when it, uh, 13 years ago, there was one neuromodulator, or we say <laughs> toxin. We all know which one that is, and it's the 800-pound gorilla. You can say the name if you'd like. But since then, we had two, three, four, and we're about to have a fifth. And um, a fifth is going to be entering the market shortly. The FDA is going to be ruling shortly uh, uh, in terms of duration and so forth. And you've watched this, and each one claims superiority or uniqueness and so forth. And this is not meant as a commercial for one or the other, but this this toxin uh, space is getting pretty crowded. What effect do you think uh, duration will have on this upcoming toxin? Uh, I believe it's going to move the um, this segment of the market forward pretty quickly. The uh, the duration issue is being addressed by the new toxin uh, from Revance uh, in a in a clinical way. I mean, it is simply um, a fact that this that this formulation works for a longer period of time. However, the the impact of that I think will be a little bit more wide ranging. Because as we all, as as I as I'm aware, and you probably as well, the other um, manufacturers are also experimenting with duration and dosages, and I think that there's going to be a wider range of dosage opportunities and uh, longevity of the you know effectiveness of the toxins over months, additional months. As we get into it, all of the companies are going to eventually have different ranges, um, and for example, uh, 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 Allergan Aesthetics has uh, picked up a company called Bonte. When Bonte was experimenting and has developed a neurotoxin that has a short duration and could be very valuable for some, uh, for some uh, uh, areas of the market, for some of the patient populations. And then you have the other manufacturers trying to increase dosage. It's, I think it's going to give uh, the consumers more opportunities and more choices. And it will create a, a dish, additional competition in a space, like you say, there was one neuromodulator back in the, in the early part of the millennium uh, with additional ones. And there are going to be more on top of that. There are some coming in from other areas of the world that are going to be marketed in, in this country as well and it's going to become a more of a global enterprise for these manufacturers it already is in many respects but in the united states we're going to have and europe we're going to have additional um, product which is going to make it a more of an interesting party let's say 
with uh, the manufacturers trying to, you know, trying to compete with each other a little more aggressively where there wasn't much competition before. And the one manufacturer that has the, 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 the large amount of uh, percentage of the market share um, will probably not get hurt too badly, but the consumers are going to have, and the physicians, the practitioners will have more choices to offer their patients. And that I think is a very good thing in the long run. I would agree. So let's change gears a little bit. What do you see in the future? If you look into your crystal ball, having been in this industry now for 13 years and you've seen the growth and development, the explosive growth, what would you tell us? What does your crystal ball tell you for the future? Well, taking a, a, the perspective of a journalist looking from the outside in, um, what I see happening is a is an evolution is an evolution um, of the patient base. Uh, there is a a major change happening among a generational change that's going on right now. Uh, the typical in the past, the typical aesthetic patient was the over forty or over fifty um, female, mostly some men, that uh, noticed in great uh, despair that their faces were becoming old looking and they wanted to recapture that youthful look. And so that was a basis for a lot of the uh, business in the medical aesthetics uh, industry, the field. But now we have, um, and that could also be said for some of the different generations is uh, baby boomers have been the long, long, long time um, uh, customers for the aesthetic industry. But now we have a change happening with younger people, uh, millennials, Generation Z, um, and, the, and beyond that, the Generation A that's coming up that are barely, they're still children. Um, <laughs> these people have been, have watched their parents, especially the millennials, let's take that as a good example. Um, they've watched their parents get treatments and you know Botox, and they've heard more and more about uh, aesthetics and the value of, of looking good. And they've integrated that into a lifestyle um, uh, attitude that aesthetics would be, go along with working out and being healthy and eating the right things and et cetera. And they're interested in um, doing some preventive work, but they're also interested in be, and accepting uh, that aesthetics is part of a regimen or a lifestyle choice. And that's a new phenomenon. Um, and as those people grow older and the generations behind them, uh, they're exposed to uh, a lot of media that also, from and our industry, that pr promotes itself as being, yes, this is good for a lifestyle choice. And uh, many uh, manufacturers, especially the injectable and um, uh, I guess the uh, energy-based uh, device people and others too have have really catered to this younger crowd that's coming up because they're coming in in large numbers um, and that will only grow and the generations behind them are likely to follow that lead. So to me, that is, the, that is a fundamental ch uh, sea change that is going on in the industry, looking from the outside in. And I see this uh, developing over time and this market penetration problem, which is a big problem with the industry, it's, it's going to become less of a problem because there's, no, there's fewer barriers or obstacles to acceptance. Uh, the, 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 the children of the, uh, uh, the, of the millennials will, will see them, their parents have adopted aesthetics as a routine, like getting a haircut or you know, getting your nails done. And they'll follow that lead. And so pretty soon we'll see a, a greater growing acceptance, I think, across the whole industry worldwide. This is a global phenomenon. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think the concept of prejuvenation as opposed to rejuvenation will certainly uh, take the, the forefront. Yes. I want to thank you very much for all of your time and sharing your insights uh, with myself and with my viewers and uh, listeners here. Thank you, it's, Jeff. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's been my pleasure. It's been wonderful, and I look forward to seeing you soon and this post-COVID world. Uh, yes. 
I'd like to thank all of you for joining us at the Technology of Beauty, where we interview the movers and shakers of the aesthetic business. Please join us every other Tuesday at the Technology of Beauty. Take care.